Acknowledgement. As we gather together, we acknowledge the sacred land on which we reside. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this gathering place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Last but certainly not least, we acknowledge the people of African descent who were brought here against their own will or in search of a safe place to live their lives and raise their children. Reconnaissance des terres. En nous rassemblant, nous reconnaissons la terre sacrée sur laquelle nous résidons. C'est un site d'activité humaine depuis 15 000 ans. Cette terre est le territoire des Premières Nations Huron, Wandat et Petun, les Séniques et plus récemment les Mississauga de la Crédit, de la rivière Crédit. Le territoire était sujet de l'alliance de la ceinture Wampun plat avec cuillère, une accord entre la Confédération Iroquois et Confédération des Ojibwe et des nations alliées à partager et à prendre soin pacifiquement pour les ressources autour des Grands Lacs. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rassemblement est toujours le foyer de nombreux peuples autochtones de toute l'île de la Tortue et Nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir la possibilité de travailler dans la communauté sur ce territoire. Nous sommes également conscients des alliances brisées et de la nécessité de nous efforcer de guérir toutes nos relations. Dernier point, mais non le moindre, nous remercions les personnes d'ascendance africaine qui ont été amenées ici contre leur volonté ou à la recherche d'un endroit sûr où vivre leur vie et élever leurs enfants. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us at Level Up today. We have our special guest with us that will be speaking with us about law and business, Courtney Kazimbi. So before we begin, and I'm going to let you know a little bit about our guest, and then I'm going to hand it over. So Courtney Kasimbi is an attorney and managing partner of Kasimbi and Associates. They have branches in five countries. That includes Canada, the U.S., Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados. Mr. Kasimbi is also the visionary founder and leader of the, the Global Institute for Transformation and Enlightenment, also known as GIFT. So I'm going to hand it over to Courtney at this time. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a wonderful, hope you all are having a wonderful afternoon. It's my pleasure to join you all today. All right. Good. So I understand that we'll be talking about law and business, right? Okay. So um, law and business. As you all know, our lives completely governed by the law. Um, for me, I have been intrigued by the law ever since I was a young kid and wanted to understand it and understand how it, how it works. So, you know, I've been intrigued by many things. Law was one of them. All right. So, yes, I think most of you are here in Canada. So we'll talk about the Canadian perspective, um, even though I practice law in a few other jurisdictions. All right. We will stick primarily with the Canadian jurisdiction, All right? So a lot of people in our community actually make the mistake of not understanding how law affect business, All right? And um, 
and it's something that is very critical in my opinion. And we should definitely spend the time, the energy and the resources to understand it. So I'm very pleased that the BBP is doing this this afternoon and that you all have joined us for this um, inquiry into how the law affect our businesses, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and it, um, yeah, so I'm gonna go straight into it. All right, so um, yeah, the law is affecting everything, period. Even you as an individual, the law affects. Now, when we enter into business, then there are different laws that apply. Um, Many of us just actually start doing business without um, registering any kind of business or without taking advantage of any of the laws surrounding businesses. And when we do business like that, we're really just doing it as an individual. We're not a business. We can basically call ourselves a self-employed individual. And as you may know, there are many of us that we're just doing our own thing. We're just self-employed. That's meaning I am my own business person. Um, And my income don't necessarily go into a business account. It goes into my own personal account. um, And that is allowed. When that happens, however, there are significant disadvantages which I will discuss later when we go into the process. Um, But what could be the advantage? Why do we want to actually just do business on their own name? Uh, Why do so many people in our community simply just do business on their own name? So let's let's, let's venture to to, to take a look at that and and just spend one minute to analyze that. Um, If there are any advantages, to just simply going out and just doing business in our own name. Um, The only advantage I can see is if you're making less than $15,000, then it may not be worth it to actually go into the formal process. So if I'm a kid in high school and all I'm doing is cutting grass for people and collecting money, or if I'm a college student and it's my part-time job just to make some websites for people and my income doesn't pass a particular um, level, then it may not make sense for me to go and incorporate my business, All right? So that's the only advantage I can see. There are really not much tax advantages, except if my income is under $10,000 or thereabout, I don't have to pay taxes. Um, so there are not a lot of advantages more than, right? Uh, that, than just the simplicity of my income is low. I also don't have to report two businesses, my two re, um, two reports to um, CRA, to Canada Revenue Agency. I just have to report just the income as my own income, All right? All right, and so that's the only advantage. So now that we, that I can see, there's not much more, just the ease and, all right? But here's the thing though, many of us now start to make more money and instead of incorporating and understanding how the business law work and understanding the effectiveness of taking advantage of businesses, we continue to operate on our own name. And that's when problems start to come in, All right? Um, and that's when we're gonna have to now literally go out and prove everything. And that's also when CRA will not necessarily allow all of our legitimate business expenses because we will have to explain to them why those are legitimate business expenses as as opposed to um, my own personal um, business. So for example, if I am operating a business and I buy, if I'm incorporated and I buy a car, I could write that car off or the lease off. But if I'm operating as my own court, as my own name in my own person, and I buy this car, it then occurs that CRA is going to say, no, this car is your own personal use. You got the money you spend on that is taxable and you'll have to pay money on that money for that car. All right. So uh, we're going to go into a little more detail. What are the advantages of incorporating? So let's talk about the different types of business operation. First of all, we just talk about one operating in my own name and my own capacity. The second one is, 
Um, I'm only registered a business name. The business isn't incorporated, but I can operate uh, Courtney Kazembe's business as um, Kazembe Wholesale, but there's no incorporation. And we'll tell you the disadvantages of that. Then we're going to talk about actually getting an incorporation, which could be a federal incorporation, or it could be, um, it could be, a, it could be a, hold on just a second. I just don't think I'm getting power. Uh, okay, guys, just give me one second. Let me plug in uh, my computer somewhere else. I don't think it's plugged okay, in. Tony, while, while, while you're plugging in, I'm, I'm just going to make a comment. So you take your time and plug in. Um, so I've, I've known Courtney Kazembi for a very, very long time, and we work together um, as well. And I remembered being in the office one day and I was talking to the team, the legal team around the table. So there was the legal team and then there's Nadine, the marketer in the midst. Um, but they were all talking about just different, just, you know, the legal stuff. So, and I said, isn't there ever any good news in the, le in the legal world? And, and all the lawyers talked about what good papers mean, what, what it is to have the right paperwork, because even when there's good news, there's always something. But what I learned in the office that day is that uh, when you formalize things and you have the paperwork and you have all the legal things ready, you're ready to, to, to do business, you're ready to take off because what we know for sure is that the negative things will happen. The, uh, and Courtney will talk about contracts when contracts go wrong and all of those things, but those are the natural things that will happen in business. And so as we look to build, grow and scale up our business, it's, it's really the best to make sure we have what we call those foundational business principles ready. And the legal paperwork is a part of that. Cool. Is, is your you. power Thank back you. on now, now Courtney? <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, not only is it important, you all is fundamental, especially if you want to grow, right? It is. It is actually fundamental, right? So um, let's uh, let's dive deeply into it. So before um, um, we were talking about a different type. So as your personal business, then you can have a business which is. Um, in business name, but it's still your personal business. You can incorporate a business and you can incorporate it federally, provincially. Um, those are the companies that have the word limited behind them or incorporated INC or LTD. And we'll talk about the significance of that. And then we can have a not-for-profit business, which sometimes we underestimate how powerful these can be. All right, because these are very, very crucial and can actually be useful. And sometimes we need to distinguish whether our business is a for-profit business or not-for-profit business. And we need to also explain the differences so that you can understand and figure out whether your business is, is a, a profit or not-for-profit. And then we can also have charitable businesses. So we want to explain that a little bit as well um, and how those work and the advantages of having those. And as well, you can have what's called a professional cooperation. We'll explain that as well. And now they're also entering into um, businesses, which is not for, which is um, a kind of B business, which is, um, which we'll explain as well. All right. So let's start then quickly and talk about, so talk about your personal business. You should understand that using a business name, you'll probably also understand that you've seen that many times. You yourself may even not incorporate it, but you have a business name. If you can register that business name and you can use it formally, the problem is you still personally liable and it's still you, just you operating under a business name, All right? The next level is to incorporate your business. And we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about incorporating your business and why it's important, all right? When you incorporate your business, you have now created a separate personality. You've created a completely separate personality from you. So when I incorporate, for example, Kazembian Associates as a law firm, yes, there's me, Courtney Kazembi, but the company Kazembian and, 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 and Associates Professional Cooperation is a completely different entity from me. It means it files its own taxes. It, it does everything independent of me. In fact, it doesn't need me. There could be different um, shareholders, different directors, 
I don't actually have to be there. In fact, I could be dead and the company can continue. Um, I could retire and the company can continue. I could be in another country. It's take on its own personage, its own ability, its own everything. It operates like it's, it's another human being. It goes to the bank and opens its own account. Of course, you need a person to actually take the paper there and you need a director to actually, yes, to actually sign papers. But that director sometimes, um, that's all they are, a director. And they don't even have to be shareholders, right? The shareholder now is a different entity, um, individuals, and we can choose who are the shareholders. The shareholders normally mean these are the people who um, put some energy into starting the cooperation. And the energy can be in the form of money. So they put up some money to start the cooperation, right? They, they put something, but they, 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 the energy don't actually have to be money. It is sometimes resources such as time, such as know-how, such as all of these important um, uh, elements of energy, right? And that is critical for a business to function, right? Some people think sometimes money is the only critical thing for a shareholder, but oftentimes, if you don't have the money, you can acquire other resources by having people with the resources such as knowledge, such as time, such as connections to actually join your cooperation and to receive um, shares as a shareholder. And sometimes if you were to get the money and to buy that same level of resources, the money may not be adequate um, to pay that person, but the person may be willing to contribute tremendous resources, um, which is far more advantageous to the survival of the company than actual money, all right? So resources to start a shareholder sometimes don't necessarily have to contribute actual physical money. Um, they can be contributing energy in another particular way, all right? While we're talking about shares, let's talk about the types of shares that typically use in a cooperation. And there are two types of shares typically. The first and most common one is called simply that, common shares, right? Common shares means that these people are actual owners of the cooperation. Um, they are the voting shareholders. These are usually the people who not only contribute money, but they are seeing themselves as critical part. They are decision makers, they have a vote, they get to vote for directors, they vote according to the amount of shares that they own in the cooperation. So let's say, for example, you're the only person um, in cooperating your company, you would own 100% of the shares, right? But let's say I really, really love your company and I want to contribute to your company. And not only do I want to contribute to your company, but I want to be, um, to have a say. I want to be able to vote. I want to be able to elect um, directors. I want to be able to, to be responsible in the company. Um, I would want to buy into your company and own common shares. So if I come to you and say, you know what, I want to be, 50% partner in your company. I want to buy 50% of your shares. This is what I want to offer you for 50% of your shares. I mean, you and I are gonna be equal partners. It would mean that you cannot make fundamental decisions without me. It would mean that you have to rely on my vote before you can take the company direction. Um, do you know what you're getting into? Um, I'm offering you 500,000, a million dollar, $100,000 for 50% of your shares, you would then have to make a decision about that, right? So that's called a common shares. I am responsible, I'm accountable. There's another type of shares, which is called preferred shares in, in a company. But let's say now I want to join your company. I want to buy $100,000 worth of shares in your company. But all I want is my money plus my interest. I don't want to make decisions. I don't want to vote. I don't, all that happens is 
I am loaning you $100,000. It will be backed by preferred shares. It will be registered. I'll have my share certificate. And if anything happened to your company, you have to pay me back my $100,000 before you can take a penny for yourself. The difference, these are the fundamental difference between preferred shareholders and common shareholders. Common shareholders have to pay back the preferred shares, all right, before they um, can, they have to pay the preferred shareholders before the common shareholders get paid. They are priority. Their, their money is, is preferred, so to speak. All right. So that's the difference. So when you enter in business and someone want to join, you have to determine whether they are common shareholders and, uh, and or if they are preferred shareholders. And you have to remember that the common shareholders get a vote and you can't just open an account at the bank that you want. You have to check with your common shareholders, especially if they have majority vote. You will have to have what's called a minute book and you'll have to call meetings and you'll have to get majority of the shareholders to make decisions in that. So sometimes I may have a company and I want to make sure that my voice is heard. So I may say, no, you can't have 50%. You can have 49%. I am keeping 51% because I want to make sure that I am the direct in mind and I want to make sure that this company go where I want. No. The person not having a no power may not invest as much as they would invest if they have power. So that's something that you would have to think about and think about where you want to go. All right. So that's in cooperation and doing shareholders. Um, one more thing I want to say about shareholders is that whenever you have shareholders, this is critical, guys. All right. You need to have what's called a shareholder agreement. All right. The shareholder agreement is your constitution. Most people want to go ahead without a shareholder agreement. Don't ever, ever do that. You are going to get into mess. No care if a person is your spouse or your mother or your sister or your brother. They want to enter your business. Say, I welcome you. I welcome your money. Let's determine whether you're just a lender, a creditor, like a bank, or you are a preferred shareholder, or you are a common shareholder. Let's have an agreement about your money how it will be how a shareholders agreement which would state that if you own shares you can't just go sell the shares to your mother-in-law who are you and you don't get along together and you never like this person and this person right you can't just get up the next morning and see your mother-in-law walking hey sorry i bought courtney's shares i am now your partner and by the way, Courtney owns 51%. So from here on, you work for me. You do what I say, all right? So you may want to have a shareholder's agreement so that that don't happen. Or you never know. Somebody could just want to mess with you and say, and offer me twice the amount of money for my shares. And I may be so happy to sell the shares to this person because they, I just invested $100,000. They want to mess with you and they come and pay me $200,000 for the share. What do you think I'm doing? I'm going to take the $200,000, right? And now you have a partner that you absolutely don't want, right? So um, that is a situation that you need a, a shareholder's agreement. Your shareholder's agreement may have a clause that say, Courtney, if anytime you want to sell the shares, you must come to me first and you must offer me the shares first, right? So it may have a clause like that. So I, you, you have no surprise if the next morning you see your mother-in-law walks in and say, hey, I just bought Courtney's shares and you know work for me. You say, no, 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 no. That's an illegal transaction. I have a shareholder's agreement here signed by Courtney saying that he cannot sell the shares without first selling me to them, with them first. So you just get lost and get out of here. I have to approve that sale. This is the agreement. All right, and, and I'm just giving you one example, but the shareholders agreement, guys, can come in so, 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 so important. Almost every lawsuit, and I'm telling you, happens um, where a problem is, is that there's no shit, no agreement. No care how the person is your best lover, your best friend, your mother, your father. You want to write down the constitution. 
you want to say, this is how we govern ourselves in this company. This is what we're committed to doing. This is our purpose. This is why we're doing this business. These are our rules and obligations. This is how we operate, right? Because you never know. Sometimes somebody just get pissed off one day. They may get, you know, and do something rash. They'll be apologetic the next day, but it, the damage is already done. And they may want to come back and say, sorry, I apologize. I shouldn't have sold my shares to this person. I shouldn't have done this. I'm so sorry. But the damage is already done. But if you have your agreement, you say, sorry, you cannot do that. We have an agreement. It's signed. It's done in front of a lawyer. You must abide by it. All right. So, guys, I'm the, I, I know I'm running. I don't want to. My time's limited. So we can go on talking about this. Just letting you know that that is crucial once you let people in. Why you want to let people in your business? Let's talk about the bigger picture. And this is something in our community that we really haven't learned how to build proper cooperations. We have been building one man cooperation, two, you know, sometimes two people, um, right? But we have not learned how to cooperate, how to do big projects in many of our communities, right? Um, and what we find as a, as a direct result of that, even in places like Jamaica and African continent, all big projects are actually being done by um, expatriates, um, people who have learned the skill of working together. It is so crucial that we learn this skill, everybody. We have to get over whatever psychological blockages there are um, so we can understand how to work with each other. You know, first of all, we have to learn to work with ourselves. We have to learn to love ourselves. We have to learn that we are trustworthy. I am trustworthy and I am living out of integrity. And once I am settled in that, I'm going to find so many other brothers and sisters who are at the same place, loving themselves, trusting themselves, and living out of integrity with common vision so we can do a proper project together. Why is it important to do that? I tell you what, none of us, none of us have all the skills, all the knowledge, all the good things. Some of us may be good at marketing and promotion. Another man may be good at making the bread. Another man may be good at making sure that we have the money to buy the building to operate the business out of. Another man may be good at doing sales, right? And this person is a wicked killer when it comes to sales. He can sell your bread three times more that you just, right? Instead of me one as a salesperson, then I try to start my business. Me have to make the bread. Me have to find the money. Me have to do the marketing and sale and then and, and promotion. And then I have to also go out and do what I'm good at, at selling the bread. By the time it gets to me now to go sell the bread, I'm so tired and exhausted. But not only am I tired and exhausted, I've spent so much energy focusing on what I am not good at that what I'm good at never even materialize, which is selling the bread. So the business suffers so tremendously. And I'm telling you guys that in your community, do this. Find people with the same kind of vision as you have. Go out and say, let's do this together. The time for us to understand, it's happening everywhere around us. All the communities are doing it, whether it's Italian, Jewish, um, um, Asian, meaning Chinese and Japanese, um, Islamic, Middle Eastern, everywhere it's, happen it's happening. And I'm not saying it's not happening in our, in our community, but it is not happening to the extent that it needs to happen. There are so many opportunities present right now, but we have to learn how to actually get over what is stopping us from working with each other. We have to learn first, yes, don't be afraid to put your agreement together. Put your agreement. That was my first point. Don't enter into anything just because a person is black and you and them are friend and, and X, Y, and Z without do, getting your constitution, without making sure you understand yourself. I'm not telling you that. You must stick with my first point for sure. But secondly, you must get over what it takes now to make sure that you are working with those few people that you can find that you can work with. All right. So I really want you guys to focus on that and make sure you have all your papers together. So the first point, make sure you incorporate your business. The second point, make sure that you have your shareholders agreement in place. 
And the third point, find people you can work with. Gonna, it will gonna expand your business tremendously. And yes, you want somebody who can find money. There are lots of money in our community. If you can't find the money back from an individual, there are other ways you can find the money. Definitely the bank. Definitely, I mean, organize yourself. And sometimes too, let's say, for example, you don't have good credit rating. Maybe you want to find a member with a good credit rating. You go to them and tell them the truth. Here, John, boy, I want to start this business. It's a great idea. It is a, whatever it is, right? I want to be a mechanic. I want to build a car. But here, what happened? My credit no good. Now, me no say, me don't want to hold that against me. But I want to go in a business with you because your credit good and you can be the first man to walk into the bank. This is the plan. This is how we're doing it. You're the critical member of the bank. Because you have good credit, you know how to manage money. We're going to put you as the accountant and charge a financial thing. I am the man who are good at the mechanic, but I can't fix any car. Right? And, all right? and we're going to have somebody now who is going to be the face of the business, who going to attract the crowd. This man is a good talker. And he love people and him get on with everybody. And the three of us want to start this business. You are the money man and the mechanic. And this man is a salesman. The three of us can succeed. Right? And you just tell the truth. This is, the, this is the other critical thing, everybody. You have to learn to tell complete disclosure when you're in business. It better you tell the person, listen, this is it. Me just come out of jail. Me not no money. Um, yes, I was convicted of X, Y, Z. My life changed. You take a chance for me. Right? Want to do this business? This is the business plan. All right? And you, and you start out your thing. Right? Always, always say what's so. Right? You want people now to learn to trust you. Right, trust is one of the most critical thing when it comes to business. I'm telling you, yes, I tell you to make your sales contract, make your contract, but getting getting people who you want to be in business with to say, listen, Virgin, that you there, and tell the truth. You no matter how bad it is, it no matter what's going on, I can tell you if him tell me it's X, it's X, and if him tell me it's Y, it's Y. And I love work with somebody who can just tell me exactly what's going on, right? And that is one of the most beautiful things that can happen when you start in a business to make sure that you stand in your own integrity, you stand in your own authenticity, you say what's so, you tell your partner the truth, you, you're in it, right? Whatever is happening. And you find that when you apply that, it becomes so incredible, all right? Um, now, I am going to probably go for another 10 minutes and then I'm going to stop. I wanted to get out a little bit earlier before two o'clock, but let us let me just mention then a few other types of incorporation because not every business have to be a for-profit business, all right? So when you start a business, let's say your business is a daycare, all right? For example, but you just love taking care of kids. And you just want to be paid a very nice salary for your effort, right? But you know, five or six other people with young kids just like you, and they want to also get involved, right? Um, and you say, you, let's, let's just start a business. No, I just completely love to take care of little kids. I am getting up every day to go work in the bank. And I'm telling you, that's not what I want to do. I just want to stay here and love all of our kids. I will love every kid like it is my kid. All right, that is my gift to the planet. I just want to love kids. And if you guys want to join me in this business, I will take care of your kids like my kids. All right, this is the situation. We're going to start this business. All of us can put our names up. We call it a not-for-profit business. We don't want to make no profit. All of the money that we go, we're going to pay in the workers and build in the business. We want to take no profit out of it, right? All right. Um, so you get your five friends, all of you young people in family, one of you just completely, it's your passion to take care of kids. You're a bank manager and you hate every day you have to go to the bank, but you love, you just even love when kids come in at the bank. When parents come in with their kids in the bank, you are the first person to go hug the kids and give the kids, you all have food there for kids when they come in hungry. You know it's your passion. 
you talk to these people about it and they say, yes, how much money we can make? We can make a big profit and na 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 na. How we can charge enough money to other families to come and yes, when other people down the road is making so much money and them charge three times what da 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 da. And you say, um, yes, but let me tell you, I have a different idea. What if we are the first daycare, which is a not-for-profit, and all we're concerned about is loving these kids? We don't want to make no money. We want to make no profit. We just want to pay ourselves, and the company pay all its business. Then go ahead, register a not-for-profit business. Some of the biggest businesses in the world are not-for-profit. Sometimes we make a big mistake believing that all our businesses must be for profit. Some of the most highly paid executives are not for profit executives and people in the business and they work very hard, right? So you want to also consider whether your business is a for, for, um, for profit business. And if your business is for profit, you're going to pay a lot of that profit to, um, to, to CRA. You're going to pay a lot of money to CRA. But if it's a not for profit business, you can have your accountant organize your work in such a way that the money that comes in gets spent on the actual people you want to serve and making the company better and people become friendly and nice and no backfighting and you develop ways of raising your consciousness and your vibration and it becomes a pleasure. You want to go to work and it's just, it's just beautiful. So you want to consider that as an option when you're starting your business, all right? And then the next thing, you can take it to a charity you now where people can donate and get tax um, incentives and the money that they contribute will be go towards um, um, your, your, your company and you can raise money and you can have fundraising events and you can have this party and this thing and you raise money and you can have, even have banks and sponsors and everybody sponsoring you and it become alive and it can be such a beautiful thing. So you also want to consider that as an option as well when you, when you decide you want to start a business, right? And I really want you to consider those two points very critically because I'm telling you, there's a significant movement in the world towards not-for-profit. And sometimes what some companies have done, they have started one for-profit company and they start a leg, which is not-for-profit. And in no time, the not-for-profit piece grow bigger than the profit piece. And they're like, whoa, there are so many advantages of not-for-profit. I'm not going to go into all of them now. Maybe one day that would be a whole talk in and of itself because that is an interesting part that is, is very crucial and very interesting, all right? So let us talk about some of the advantages then of why you want to incorporate. And I'm gonna run through these very quickly. Uh, I mentioned taxation, that is a huge one. If you're incorporated, you pay less tax than your personal tax, all right? If you're incorporated, you can spend a lot more money in your business, developing your business, um, advancing your business, and uh, if you as a business you only take out of your business what you actually need for your own personal thing so people are, may, are running multi-million dollar business and their income is a hundred thousand dollars right but their car is is owned by the business right you think about it how much of your car you actually use for your work you drive it to and from work right so all your gas is no shouldn't be come out of your taxable income. Your car payment shouldn't come out of your taxable income. If you think about it, I mean, a lot of your food is lunch, right? Your lunch money is business income. You shouldn't, you know, you after work, you meet somebody for dinner. That shouldn't be coming out of your taxable income, right? So when you incorporate a business, one of the powerful is tax incentives. You pay a lower tax on the profit. You can report less profit because a lot of it now is not, is, you can now put that in as business expense. You, you, you know, if you need a particular dress code for your work, that's business expense. You need a particular you know, business expense. If you work at home, you can know your part of your mortgage is now not coming out of your taxable income because your business can now rent an office in your home. And now that money, that's going towards your market is no, not taxable. You can save so much money, all right? If you incorporate, all right, that is crucial. But let me give you one more critical point, which is um, liability. And, and this actually for most people is the most critical point. When you incorporate a business, it is called limited, all right? The reason why it's called limited is because of limited liability. 
right? It means that that business, your exposure is limited to the amount of money you put into the business. So let's say, for example, I start a business and I invest $100,000. But then somebody sue me for a million dollars, right? Um, out of something that the company did. I say, I'm sorry, you're suing me, Courtney Kazembe. You're suing the wrong person. Courtney have nothing to do with this. Who you need to sue is Kazembe and Associates. And I only invested a hundred thousand dollars. So that's all of my exposure. If you win your million dollar suit, right? You can come to me, right? That's all I invest. So I get to keep my million dollar. And all I would lose is what I invest in the company if they succeed. All right. Um, so critical thing, the liability is so crucial. Let me give you a real practical example. You own a patty shop, right? Somebody come in, you never clean the snow, them fall, break them leg, they sue you for a million dollars. You didn't incorporate that business. Yes, them can take the patty shop, them can take your house, them can take your car, they can take whatever you have because you didn't incorporate the business and therefore you are personally liable. However, on the other hand, if you are incorporated, you're just like, hey, sue me, Bridget, I don't own the party shop. Ex-cooperation, own the party shop. I am just a worker. <laughs> yes, right? That nothing to do with me. You sue me, the court, the, the court will throw that out the next day and charge you money and pay my expenses because you sue me I'm not the entity that own a party shop. It's Kazembi Party Shop. You have to sue Kazembi Party Shop. All right? So you have to understand all these kind of things. Insurance is another element. All of these things are other elements that are so crucial and so important that, you know, right? but let's talk about banking and funding now. All right? Because that's crucial too. All right? Let's say I own a, a, a cooperation. Um, and the first thing I go to the bank and I ask the bank for a certain amount of money. I say, who are the shareholders? Who are the directors? Let's say I say, I am the only shareholder. I am the only director. The bank will pay me. But yeah, I can't lend you a million dollar, Courtney. Maybe I'll lend you a 50 grand, right? Because are you one, right? What if something happened to you? You could walk out, walk out the idea and carry it you down. We lose our million dollar because you not here anymore. But if you come in with three of your friends and say, we have a legitimate cooperation. There are three shareholders and three directors. Here are the three of us. The three of us have combined and put $100,000 together. We're going to start this business. I am this person with this expertise. This is the person with this expertise. This is the person with expertise. Here are our resumes. Once you put it together, this is a big. We want a million dollars. Now the bank will take that seriously. You now play in a different game. You'd also come in to the bank for sure. The last thing I'm going to talk about before I see if anyone have any questions is planning business planning it is so crucial to have your business plan which is to put your idea down on paper to know exactly where you're going know exactly what you want know how much money it's going to cost know where you're going to buy your raw material know where you're going to sell your product know that you have experience in the business know who are the direct in mind know where you're going to find your talent know where you're going to find your people to work for you it is so critical and crucial that you cannot estimate how powerful and how important it is to have your business plan. Business plan. This is the most important and incredible thing that you need to do. I, in fact, me not lending you one dime of my money until you show me your business plan. I've said that to people over and over and I let them go back and make them business plan and so often, I dive into my thing and say, here is this. I'm a want to be a shareholder and I have business. Because once I look through the business plan, we can say, yeah, you put your mind to it. You, you address these factors. And sometimes I may see a weakness in the business plan and I may say, yeah, but how you, what, what is your expertise? You want to open a party shop, but there are three party shops on the street. What is your thing? The man said to me, yo, why well, I tell you one thing, you know, I want to open a Rasta party. And you know, I was no meat, no my party, no bridging. Uh, I tell you that bridging, I put up a big sign say Rasta party. I mean, I tell you, not just Rasta man going to come once the general public is my Rasta party, it's still off. <laughs> Your bridging, man, I'm in, right? And I'm giving plan and have my money, right? So you want to make sure you have your plan, right? And and all right, it's cool. I'm gonna stop here, guys. I can go on forever, but. 
I want to, I want to go. I, I want to leave you all too. So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to ask questions. I'm only gonna take like Co three Courtney, questions. You, Courtney, you cannot leave yet. The chat is blowing up with everybody loving your stories and everything. We just love your presentation. There's lots of questions. So there's lots of things here. Love, love, love him. Love your energy, Courtney. He's so entertaining to watch. Um, just absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. And I know you were crunched for time today, but you stayed with us. So there's a lot of questions. Victoria is going to pull the questions and ask you them. But um, yeah, um, your points today, all of it, everything, just very much dynamic. Go ahead, uh, Victoria, with the questions for Courtney. Awesome. So let's just hop to, I see a hand raise, Galaxy A51. Are you still there? You can, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute myself. Perfect. Um, this has been such uh, an experience. I think you're in my head, Courtney, because you have been speaking my language. I want to do something spectacular this year before the end of the year starts. So it's a massive undertaking. Um, I want to start a real estate business to bring in our community and teach them how that they can allow themselves to own some property. I have a little bit of money and I went to the bank and the bank was just limiting me. And I'm thinking if I have this amount and I know my community has this amount and um, when they go, if they have the same kind of fight to get some money from the bank, how can we come together? And that's where my vision came in. I want to start a credit union here in Canada for our community. And I've and, um, liaised already with Jamaica because I have no idea how to start something like that. We have so much money in our community and we need to come together to figure out, and, and the word is trust. This is going to teach us the thing that I'm embarking on. I don't really want to get into too much of my confidential stuff, but the thing that I'm embarking on is teaching us how to trust and how to love each other in such a way that we're going to infect the neighbors and the neighbors' neighbors within our community. So my question is, how can we figure out? I just um, registered my foundation. It's called Golden River Foundation. And um, I would like to have an extension of a, um, a bank, a credit union in there as well as um, something else, I can't think of the word right now, but how do I bring this to fruition? I mean, right. I think okay. it is. <laughs> all right, so first of all, what's your name? It's Karen. Karen, Karen right. Stevens. Karen, Nadine, I'm gonna request you give her my number. Um, her, yeah. she, needs, she needs a consultation and I'll grant you 30 minutes free consultation because of be your fantastic. association with BBPA. But it's yeah. not a question that can be answered in a minute in the time I have. Well, that's so, what I was hoping because I had reached out to Nadine, but I don't. It was just recently that I've gotten this connection because, I mean, you know, and um, but so she hasn't had a chance to get back to me yet. But this was the perfect form for that to be able to um, engage with you. This is like, oh my god, I'm right. like, and, and Nadine, so I, I over the next two three weeks, I'll give away. Um, it, it has to be like no more than two per week, but I'll give away five free half an hour consultation with your group. All right. You are so going whoever... to be so thank you, Courtney. Um, thank you. Courtney. Pleased with that thank opportunity, you. Courtney. I guarantee you. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Thank you so much for your question. Question from Simone: What happens when you register your business and another company has your business name but is not operating? What can you do to obtain this business name as your own? Well, you can find out who owns it and buy it from them. That's the first thing. Or you can see how long ago this was registered and ask permission from Canada Business Association. But technically, if the name is already taken, you have to find another name. Okay, thank you. And there was another question from Simone here on independent contractors. Let's see. Um, what happens when you are an independent contractor in construction, used to work for an employer, but no longer working for them, and then one of their clients come to your company for your services instead? 
what do you do at that point? Okay, so if there's no contract between you and your, your employer, you're free to accept the new contract. Um, if there's a non-compete contract in your contract with your former employer, then you may have to respect that contract, all right? That original contract with the employer and non-compete. Usually non-compete has to be very time-specific and also location-specific. Um, otherwise, a court will not adhere to it. So the courts love to have freedom of trade, which means that we are free to bought, bought our services to clients. The most important thing is in your own heart, make sure you're ethical and you're not stealing a client from your former boss like underhandedly. Thank you. And from a P, I am, I am in my startup phase. I am obviously, I obviously cannot afford an expensive lo local attorney or retainer yet at this point. All I need is legal advice and have some legal questions answered. What would be an affordable option to assess legal advice? So I have very, very competent paralegals and junior lawyers in my firm. Um, and if you were to come to our firm and express that you need help, I am sure we're going to help you and also give you a budget that you can afford. Excellent. Uh, let, so let's not just be a plug about our firm. I'm sure you can find other firms that would do the same for you. Thank you. Just be, again, Denver. again, just be honest and tell the truth from the start, you know, and just say, you know, yeah, we need your help. And this is what I can afford. Can you help me? And um, there are so many lawyers, I'm sure that would be prepared to help you at the at a cost that you can, again, you can afford. Okay, question from Beverly. Can someone be a director in the company and not be a shareholder or or investor or vice versa? The answer is yes. The shareholders vote on the director. But usually you really would like to have your director who's direct in mind of the cooperation on, some, uh, on something, right? You, you know, people sometimes when they know they own even one share, they're invested. You want them to put their ass on the line. So you want to find out, you know, a director is really a very important thing. It can be like the CEO of the company. They are, so you, you know, even, but, but a lot of people really go out and look for, for directors and CEOs. They don't have to have, be a shareholder, but as you know, it's a very critical position, all right? And sometimes you find people go head hunting, right? And go hunt for a CEO and hunt for a managing director. Usually their package or their incentive would be some kind of shares and sometimes based on their performance as well. The company is now worth $100 million. You take this company $200 million in two years, you get X shares, right? So you want a person to be really invested. And sometimes you hear that a CEO make a lot of money. That's because their contract is tied to their performance. And if they perform, perform well, such a person can really walk away with a lot of money, right? And that's why also as a business owner, don't be too, do too quick to make, uh, to put incentives in your CEO or your director's contract because without knowing the penalty because that director could perform so well and you'll be tied to a contract where you have to pay up when you see the millions flowing in and you're like, how come you're making more money than us? You sign a contract. You know, all right? Yeah, and that happens and so often. Excellent, thank you. Question from Lucky, I see your hand raised. Let okay, guys, so we're gonna to... take the last one because I need to do something before okay. three o'clock, unfortunately. So this is okay. the last question. This is my, the last question. I was just going to ask, I, I, so I had you talking about uh, business expenses and uh, the, you refer to dressing a uh, code, uh, dressing a uh, uh, clothes. I'm just wondering where should I want to go to? Is that advertisement? What expenses are you, are you going to take all your expenses on dressing uh, materials? I just want to. Uh, so, yeah. so, depending on your business, your yeah. uniform is part of your business expenses, which can actually go on the entertainment, clothing, um, equipment. All right. So, if you have a, um, if you have a, a, a mechanic shop and you need to buy overall, a particular overall, you can expense that, right? Um, Sometimes, for example, you're going to a lawyer. So where's your closing your suit? Where do they go to? 
Okay, so as a lawyer, yes, you can actually expense some of your clothes and attire. Um, a lot of companies actually put it on their uniform or equipment, um, but there are ways you can talk to your accountant about what category you put that under. All right. Thank you, no, guys. Yeah. No, guys, I'm going to, fortunately, I have to go. Um, I want to thank you all for connecting with me and for giving me this opportunity. Um, thank you. I want to encourage you all to um, do your best. Um, live your life with love and integrity and trust. Stand in the power of your own authenticity. Love who you are. Love yourself. And we are here to serve our community and to serve the world. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Um, let me just take 30 seconds to see if anyone is interested in the courses we teach. I'm sure, Nadine, you would know some of it. You can pass on that information. Cool. We teach courses about raising your vibration and raising your consciousness. Grace and my thank you. My peace, my love, I leave with you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Courtney. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Courtney. Nadine, <laughs> thank you for hopping up. We actually had a question about how um, Courtney was talking about a business plan. He doesn't do anything without the business plan, hearing about it. They want to know how they can get access to a business plan or help themselves. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for you to tell them about the Bates program that we yes. have on Thursday. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we have our Bates program on Thursdays, which is the Business Advisory Implementation and Development Services. It is a wraparound program where the BBPA have Black um, experts in different fields that hold your hand, literally, um, in, in your respective area and field to help you um, build um, structure your business. Uh, the Bates program came out of when COVID happened, a lot of business, a lot of Black businesses didn't qualify for the SIBA loans uh, because, you know, their business plan, their, their financial statements wasn't done and so forth. And even now, as we are looking at applying for the FACE loans, one of the criteria in the FACE loans is that your business must be registered. So that's Courtney talking about the registration. You must have a business plan and you must have a financial statement. We have accountants to do the financial statement and we also have business plan um, writers to do the business plan. So if you apply through the Bates program, we're a little bit backed up right now because there's a lot of people um, applying, but we're getting the, um, the numbers responded to very quickly and you can apply to the Bates program if you need a business plan done. Um, and you know, we've had great guest speakers. We had the business development um, Bank of Canada um, that uh, participated at one of the FACE events two weeks ago at the um, Mastermind Monday, uh, the Masterclass Monday, and also at the Bay, at our Boss Woman program. And if you can, the, the, the session is online and it's fantastic information on elements you need for a business plan. So I also suggest that you use that resource as well. Excellent. Thank you, Nadine. And just to let you know what we have coming up a little later this week. Um, so Wednesday, we have Ask a Pro Professional at 12 o'clock. And then Thursday, we have our Bayes program, which I will be back on that one where we will be going over our accounting topic. And then, oh, Boss Women tonight. Don't want to forget that 6 p.m. Right, Nadine? We have yes, Boss Women tonight. tonight. And we have a leading... Um person from TD Bank who is going to be presenting. So again, she will have gems to share. And then I think uh, Uju will also be presenting. She's a dynamic, engaging marketer and she'll be presenting as well. And Victoria will be um, hosting our Boss Woman session tonight. So I look forward to seeing you all there at six o'clock. Excellent. Anything else, Nadine, before we wrap up? No, that's Today. it. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to the Level Up, uh, the Masterclass in Finance. And our guest speaker today was just absolutely incredible. Um, definitely reach out. I, I put my email down there to email info at bbpa.org if you'd like a consultation with uh, Courtney and just put um, consultation with Courtney and we'll have that done. And I think I see someone's hand up. I'll take one yes. last question, Craig. Let's see, Craig. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to ask... Um, uh, like I don't want to impose, but like I look at the speakers for the for the boss women um, group, and I like obviously um, it's catered towards women. Um, but in the event that let's say a speaker who may present something that's really important or you really want to hear, um, 
is there a way to work around that? Like, I don't want to kind of impose on that. So like maybe- Listen, Craig, you're, you're not imposing. I heard your session last week and fell madly in love with you and what you presented. We have to have you on The Boss Women. We would love to have you on. We'll just need to reach out to Uju to get you on. Um, so Craig did a session last week, last Wednesday at BBPA. It's called How to Be Likable. Is, is that it? It was basically leveraging the the power of, of charisma into better opportunities in, in your career and in your life. But um, yeah, no, I see the speakers on the boss women stuff and I'm like, man, like I, I kind of want to attend every single one. It just looks like, but I, I don't. <laughs> we do have a few men. We do have a few men. I don't know if Ross is here. It's, it's the boss women and Ross. <laughs> We do have a few men that show up. So definitely, um, we'd love to have you on. So we'll, we'll take that offline. But what you presented in terms of leveraging your, chariz- your charisma, personality, your likability factor um, for your business was absolutely remarkable. A lot of gems and we would love to have you on. So um, okay. just, just wait for us, Craig. You'll, you'll hear from us very soon. Okay, awesome. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.